All right, so let's get started. Once again, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Guillaume Decuges from uh, Linkfluence. Very excited to have this webinar uh, with you today on social maturity from listening to intelligence. So I'm here together with uh, Jessica um, Liu from uh, Forrester. Uh, so quick words on myself. So I'm the CEO of Linkfluence, which is now a malware company. Very excited to have this, um, this webinar here with Forrester. Uh, Jessica, do you want to say a few words to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you, Guillaume. Uh, I'm Jesse Liu. I'm a senior analyst at Forrester on the B2C marketing team. Uh, I've been covering social listening and intelligence for six years at Forrester, and I'm really excited to be here to talk to you guys today. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thanks so much for taking the time, and um, we've had a chance to do uh, webinars and have multiple conversations in the past, and I can um, guarantee that there are a few people who know uh, so much on social data and social intelligence uh, than Jessica. So we're very excited to have her uh, spend time with us today. All right, so what we wanted to cover, uh, so talking about the agenda, we, we want to really cover those four parts. So first, uh, Jessica is going to share with us, um, you know, how Forrester and how she's seeing social intelligence and how it's different from consumer intelligence and how the two are connected together. Talking then in the second part about Forrester's uh, intelligence maturity model. And um, then I'm going to take over and talk about how you know uh, we think about growing brands maturity with social data and try to you know show concrete wins for brands at very various level of uh, maturity. So that's what we're going to be covering today. We're going to try to have this webinar run for about 30, 35 minutes so that we have time for Q and A and um, you know um, stick in the 45 minutes uh, allocated times. Um, and with that being said, let's then get started. Um, Jesse, I'm going to make you the presenter. All right. So I want to start in, in sort of true dictionary style. <laughs> start with a few definitions, if you don't mind. Indulge me. Uh, and so at Forrester, we think about social listening first as a verb. Um, and you can see here on the slide, social listening is the tracking, is tracking online discussions uh, using social media monitoring tools. And we separately think about social intelligence as something different. Um, a noun. Social intelligence, as you can see on the slide, is the management and analysis of customer data from social sources used to activate, measure, and recalibrate marketing and business programs. Now, social intelligence has amazing potential in companies. It has potential to augment other consumer intelligence sources and practices. And social media data, as you guys know all too well, comes in quickly. Um, I don't want to say real time, but maybe near real time. And it's, of course, unsolicited feedback, unlike surveys or focus groups. The problem in uh, most companies today is that social media data is stuck in this silo. And to illustrate this, uh, I, I created this slide. You can see today social media data mainly impacts these contained groups in the four green circles, marketing, PR and corporate communications, market research or consumer insights or customer insights, some blend of, of that type of um, team, as well as data and analytics. The social media data is really hoarded amongst the, these groups or departments, and not intentionally, it's just sort of the state of, state of the, of the uh, reality. And this remains true uh, despite social media data growing in importance year over year in companies' data and analytics practices. So we have surveyed data and analytics practitioners um, year over year in one of our annual benchmark surveys. And in 2019, you can see here on the slide, 54% of data and analytics technology decision makers that we surveyed were expanding implementation or they were in the process of implementing social analytics into their data and analytics practices. And that number grew in 2020. Um, you can see here it grew in the red and the dark green bars to 69%, um, likely increased by the pandemic that year. And um, particularly because this, this survey is actually fielded at the second half of the year, results coming in in Q4, so capturing that 2020, um, the 2020 data from earlier in the year. And you can see here in 2021 that the number stayed pretty consistent at 69% roughly uh, in terms of those who were expanding implementation or uh, were in the process of implementing social analytics into their data and analytics practices. So 
from my point of view, very promising numbers in terms of companies considering social analytics, uh, including that listening and intelligence data into their overall enterprise-wide um, data and analytics practices. So here's what companies should strive for. Social media data can play a role across the company from CX, customer experience, to security and risk, to uh, human resources or employee experience. All of these departments or teams can benefit from social media data to better understand their consumers, um, or in some cases, their actual customers, um, or maybe like the talent that you're trying to recruit and hire to work at your company. Social media data benefits all of these teams. So to make this happen, Enterprise Insights really does require unshackling that social media data. You need to get social media data out of that silo. So if you think about social media data as simply just one data source that is feeding into your unified consumer intelligence programs or uh, your, your um, broader consumer intelligence activities, you are in a good position right, right from the start. So if you think about, uh, for example, a unified view of consumers uh, might include data sets across many teams like marketing, which would maybe provide the social media data. Uh, it could include teams like customer experience or voice of the customer teams. It could include contact center and customer service teams, maybe the digital or web team, uh, product teams, retail teams like in-store, uh, market research teams, all of these teams are collecting data about the consumer or the specific customer. And when enterprises collaborate uh, and unify all of the disparate uh, consumer intelligence and voice of the customer programs and all of the different data sources that exist across those teams, those departments, those silos, like you can see in this graphic, and if those companies can bring together all of that CX data in one place and do it consistently and at scale, these companies can really achieve. It's inspiring, actually. I get excited talking about it, and from my perspective, at least. Um, but at the moment, I, I'll be honest, these types of unified programs that sort of help organizations collect and analyze and act on consumer intelligence and customer feedback, they're pretty nascent. They continue to lack maturity. They sort of struggle to move from a foundational program to a state-of-the-art program, you know, one that can truly achieve full data integration. There is a lot of room to grow in the companies that we work with, that we survey, that we talk to. Um, and there's a lot of room to improve, especially in the areas of collaboration across these teams and departments. So the good news is there are things that we can work on. No one has perfected this yet. And it is encouraging um, that we've seen in our data, uh, in a small survey we conducted back in 2020 of social listening platform users, Companies did tell us that they are integrating uh, and applying social media data to market research data sets, to voice of the customer data sets, uh, which you can see in the, the top two answer choices on this data chart. And then further down the list, um, chat transcripts, contact center transcripts. So um, this tells me there is awareness, there's momentum, and it's moving in the right direction, which is encouraging, in my opinion. So, in addition to integrating those disparate data sets to form that stronger consumer intelligence program, um, companies also need to think about integrating all the disparate measurement and analytics tools that you're using to derive and leverage any learnings um, across the customer lifecycle. So measurement tools, which I know are quite broad, but they are critical components of the enterprise tech ecosystem. They complement practices like the traditional market research you might be doing, um, maybe public relations activity you're doing or strategic planning uh, activities. Um, and you can see here in this, in this chart, uh, or in this graphic rather, that social media data in particular plays a role in the broader measurement and analytics ecosystem by contributing to customer understanding. That's that dark green inner circle there, um, which is another way of saying consumer intelligence as, as I've been talking about in the last few slides here in this webinar. Social listening really does provide some of that consumer feedback, that consumer insight, that consumer intelligence that you're looking for. And it's just, again, one piece of the bigger puzzle. 
So hopefully in just a few slides, <laughs> I've managed to convince you of the merits of consumer intelligence and social media's role or contribution to that. Um, and it, if you're ready, it really is time to move from siloed social insights to broader intelligence to really achieve full business impact. And you can start with, uh, I guess, two quick, two quick starting tips from me. Um, first is shift from passive social listening to active research and planning. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail in a few slides, but just to plant the seed, shift from passive social listening to active research and planning. Um, when you think about implementing a full intelligence practice, companies typically move through a maturity curve, right? And we at Forrester have talked about four stages of maturity, which I'll show you on a, on a subsequent slide. But it allows companies to sort of start at that baseline crisis management and eventually use social data to help further support marketing and business strategies later on. And then second, get comfortable with both deterministic and probabilistic social data. I'm someone who loves absolutes. I want deterministic data. It's much clearer, it's more straightforward, but probabilistic data is the norm when you're dealing with social media platforms, especially today with user privacy policies and regulations really strengthening um, and social networks being forced to make, um, uh, to protect user privacy and, and make generalizations and assumptions based on user interests, behaviors, and comments. Uh, at an anonymized and aggregated level over structured user-specific data. It is more the norm today, and it's okay because you're able to still glean insight and draw conclusions from that. Forrester offers this framework called the four Ps that could help you think about getting started. Um, the four Ps help you build an intelligence practice, and it starts with purpose and then uh, determining people, the right talent, then the platform, what technology do you need? And then the process that you'll put in place internally, what are the workflows and who are the stakeholders and how does the work flow through your company? So if you start with, let's just go deeper on purpose, um, starting with purpose. So intelligence can serve a variety of business purposes. You know, it could, it could cover, it could deliver on competitive intelligence, um, sentiment and influence measurement, um, sentiment, emotion and influence measurement, I should say, uh, product development, media buying decisions. There are many business purposes that intelligence can, can serve you. So you really want to define your primary purpose, your goals that you want to focus on um, and continuously measure and track your progress towards those goals because as you know, tracking success is impossible without explicit goals to work towards. Um, so you're going to be able to make those appropriate adjustments to your purpose, depending on your maturity level, which I promise I will get to in the next slide. Then you can decide on people. A business intelligence typically requires, I would say, three types of people. The first is leaders to make the plan and drive the strategy, usually a more uh, and, and helpful if this is coming from your C-suite in particular, your executive leadership. The second type of person you need is a dashboard administrator to sort of manage and mine the data. They're in the weeds of, of the data. And the third is the analyst to actually interpret data and uncover insights, make it actionable, draw conclusions. How are we going to apply this to our business goals? And you really do need to nurture the skills of all of those types of people who can build the value uh, out of that data and especially complex social media data um, across the organization, because this isn't a one team effort. Which leads me to platform. Each, uh, each intelligence vendor solutions or services or objectives might vary. Uh, and it's, I mean, I'm sure you've all been in the shoes of it's difficult to find a one size fits all solution across all intelligence practice needs. So instead think about your end goal, that objective you outlined in purpose, uh, when making a purchasing decision. And you can find a vendor that hopefully delivers the right data and matches your specific use case and your maturity level, and ideally can help you grow into the maturity level you'd like to get to. And then finally process, the last P. Uh, so when you think about process, formalized methods can improve the results of listening and intelligence efforts but you do need to establish methods for managing incoming data, identifying insights from that data and creating workflows for distributing those insights and applying them to your business objectives. So process is important, even though it's the last P, 
uh, I do want to emphasize that it is important and um, has to be a key pillar of the Four Ps Foundation. So with that Four Ps framework, you can get started on building your consumer intelligence practice um, using social media data in particular as one of the biggest inputs that you, you have. And you can grow along this intelligence maturity model that you see here. And I'll walk through each one of these steps. So stage one, we think about as monitoring. It's crawling. If you think about a newborn, you're crawling. Uh, this is about really establishing your practice around just capturing social media data. Um, you might be learning the ropes in social media and beginning to understand sort of the data qualities, the facets of that data and the different social media platforms and what types of data they offer um, or what types of data they create and offer through, um, through their APIs. And then a lot of focus in this stage, I would say, typically is crisis management or uh, PR use cases, maybe some competitive tracking. From stage one monitoring, you can then move to stage two listening, walking. Here you should um, be identifying actionable insights from social media. You uh, could also be analyzing the data you're collecting and recommending actual business changes based on those insights. So for example, um, typically we see activities like focusing on market research, marketing measurement, or customer service uh, and customer support happening in this stage. And then the next stage is uh, stage three, intelligence, running. So here you want to think about integrating social data into your existing business strategies and technologies. Uh, it's really an opportunity to automate the insights process and distribute social media data across the organization. Um, and, and typically in this stage, we see social media data most commonly used for customer insights and predictive analytics uh, in the third stage, the run stage. Which brings me to stage four, enterprise consumer intelligence, flying. Wouldn't we all love to fly? I would. Uh, take a holistic approach here to listening inside and outside the boundaries of social media. I talked earlier about those broader and more holistic consumer intelligence practices and voice of the customer programs. Um, multiple teams and organizations are now in this stage are now using social media data in conjunction with other feedback data, data including, as I talked through earlier, maybe things like customer call center transcripts, results from surveys, focus groups, all of this incoming feedback data to answer business questions. Um, text analytics tools are hopefully integrated here. Um, they process social and non-social media data side by side. Um, and at this point, you are, as I said earlier, enterprise-wide consumer intelligence is being used across the entire company. So no matter where you are in this path, this is a maturity curve. It's fine to be on the left and it's fine to be on the right. It is a process. Um, and no matter where you are in this path, I hope you found this somewhat helpful. Um, so that's it for me. And I will send this back to Guillaume. Thanks for listening. All right. So yeah, no, really great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so at, at LinkFluence and at Mouthwater, we're, um, we're strong believers that uh, the journey towards you know, leveraging social data more and more is, is just getting started for um, enterprises and brands. And, um, and what you shared clearly showed that. I think, you know, there's a, there's a journey and uh, no matter where you are on that journey, there's, uh, there's additional things that, uh, uh, that will be done. Uh, okay, so now we'd like to share with you the way um, we've been trying to think about social media intelligence maturity at LinkFluence, uh, as well as some concrete examples of what brands have been able to achieve at various uh, uh, stages of maturity. Uh, before I go into that, there's, um, there's a questions uh, tab for those of you who are not familiar with um, the GoToWebinar control panel. You should see questions and we'll take questions at the end. So feel free to um, log your questions directly in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, so for those who don't know us, um, so we define ourselves as, a, as an AI enabled consumer insights platform. Uh, we focus uh, mostly on, you know, empowering global consumer brands, such as the ones you're seeing on that slide, um, to um, turn social data into actionable insights. We think that's really what, um, so we leverage AI to do this. Uh, we, we don't just collect the social data, but we use artificial intelligence and industry expertise to really turn that into uh, actionable insights. And for those of you who want to know more, 
Uh, there's also a handout uh, section in the go to webinar control panel and you can learn more about uh, Linfluence. And also we're now part of the Melfitter group. Uh, we've been acquired by Melfitter about a year ago and we became their uh, consumer insight center of excellence. So let's talk about um, social intelligence maturity. So um, first, this is something that you know, we feel is very important to us. Um, at Linfluence, we don't see ourselves just as a SaaS platform vendor. Uh, but we also provide the, the, the relevant services to implement and manage uh, this platform. And so this is really you know, a partnership we, we, we built with our clients to help them on that journey that uh, Jessica was, was talking about. And this is really about driving uh, those, those clients' maturity uh, up. So this is why we felt for a while now that we needed to have some kind of simple way to assess, measure, but also you know, find also actionable insights on how to drive this maturity up. And this is um, what we'd like to share with you today. And we'll, we'll make that very concrete, concrete through, through examples, but we'll also share with you uh, a link uh, for you to directly start assessing uh, the maturity of your brand and organization with social intelligence. So we think the good proxies for social intelligence maturity um, are, you know, along the three things you're seeing on that slide. So think of application uh, as the number and type of use cases for which social data is used at, at your company. And I'm gonna give some, some concrete examples of that, but that's what we measure with application. Adoption is of course, the number of people involved and, and using uh, platforms, social listening platforms, but also the stakeholders that are impacted and not just their share numbers, but uh, also the types of departments, uh, the type of teams involved um, in leveraging social data. And execution is, I think, the critical part because all of this data is really important, but it does not achieve anything unless there are some concrete business decisions which are being made leveraging this, uh, this social data. So this is what ex execution captures. Um, and to make this concrete, here's you know, some of the use cases we've been developing uh, at LinkFluence with our clients in terms of how to use uh, social data. So, you know, starting from reputation management, um, the, the typical social listening cases uh, that Jessica was mentioning, you know, crisis monitoring, um, maybe some, you know, competitive benchmarks, but also looking at the success of your campaigns, understanding your influencers, getting some inspiration, or some inspiration for content. Um, but at the top, we've also seen more and more uh, brands wanting to tap into the the use cases which were traditionally addressed by market research with surveys, polls, the, the traditional um, ways to understand consumers with market research. So this is um, you know, the um, application part and this is what we're looking at when we're looking at use cases. So how many of those use cases are deployed and are those the basic social listening use cases or are we starting to tackle the more advanced market research use cases? In terms of adoption, this is how we look at it. Is it, you know, ported as, as Jessica mentioned by one team and one team only? Or are we starting to see that um, multiple departments are using social data? Um, and not just different types of departments, but different markets and regions and maybe different brands, products or, or business units. And finally, those are the types of decisions we, we like to look at whether, you know, brands are uh, making those decisions um, or using social data for. So new product decision, um, but also, you know, volume forecasting, uh, merger and acquisition. Um, this has been a, you know, we've had a number of use cases around this. Uh, media investment, of course, and so on, audio segmentation, market resource allocation. So you can see from all of those uh, that those are concrete decisions that can be informed by social data. So it's fundamental in our opinion that this data doesn't stay uh, in a silo and is not just data for that is, that is sake, but is also informing some concrete strategic or operational uh, decisions. And so the way we, we like to visualize this, and again, we'll, we'll share a link with you if you wanna you know, uh, take this assessment, you'll, you'll have those results in um, you know, that format. So this is a simple way to visualize it. We, we have a, a Y axis, which is the application, uh, an X axis, which is execution and the size of the bubble uh, which kind of measures adoption. Uh, so pretty, pretty simple way to visualize it. And you can, you can look at it at a company level or at an entity level. 
Uh, so for instance, you know, the way to read this is that for instance, in this example, and we won't share who that is, this is all, you know, confidential and we never share, um, you know, the social maturity of, um, of our clients with anybody else. But in that case, which is a real example, you can see that the, the four markets uh, in the lower right are pretty advanced in terms of execution and adoption, but probably with maybe one or two use cases. And so, you know, one of the ways you can think about improving here is adding to this uh, to those markets some additional use cases. Um, and and the other thing you can drive from derive from this is if you look at France and UK, uh, you can see that execution is lower, adoption is lower, but more use cases have been deployed. So maybe this is what those entities need to be focusing on is like, how do we drive more decisions um, and, and adoption for um, the social data implementation? So that's a very, um, you know, tangible and concrete way to that we use with, with our clients to measure progress of our partnerships and also, you know, strategize with our, with our clients what should be happening next in terms of priority, uh, priorities for the deployments of our platform and the services we bring alongside with it. So now that we've looked at the model, let's look at, um, you know, the things you can expect at various uh, steps of uh, maturity. Uh, so we wanted to share with you, you know, three simple examples um, at the macro steps that do not exactly match the one that Jessica presented. We call them exploring, competing, and disrupting, but uh, you get the idea, and this is pretty much how you can progress along this uh, this maturity uh, model here. Uh, and note that, you know, we won't, uh, again, share what stages in particular those, those clients were in, uh, but just some example of use cases that are matching some, some level uh, of maturity. So very concrete one, um, you know, creating more impactful uh, campaigns. So this is what we think, you know, companies that are at the exploring stage, so the, the, the first stage in the maturity should be uh, tackling, you know, are my campaigns impactful or not? This is something that social data can help you um, answer. And so, you know, this is something we, we worked with Porsche when they launched the Taycan, which were their first uh, electric uh, vehicle. Um, and the challenge really here was to change the percep perception of the brand. Uh, you know, Porsche is, uh, has been, you know, vocal about the fact they're pursuing a, a strategic repositioning from, you know, being a, um, a premium uh, car maker to becoming a contemporary luxury brand, targeting new customers with uh, electric vehicles, which uh, are new for, um, for the brand. And so we deployed Radarly, which is our uh, consumer insights platform across um, you know, worldwide across the main markets and to really understand, you know, what were driving the success of different campaigns and help amplify what worked well and, and improve uh, what, uh, what didn't. So great success with this. Um, and this is really one of the use cases you should really uh, have in your portfolio. So in that application level, when you're at the exploring stage, when you move to the next stage, which we'll, we call competing, um, you can, um, you know, start to tackle some of the most advanced use cases, which are typically, again, things that historically brands have been using market research for. Now, market research is great, but the interest with social data is um, that, you know, it's live, it's spontaneous. So there are multiple benefits of using social data to tackle things like, you know, understanding better your audience. So, for instance, in this case with Danon, we've been working on what we call tribes, and tribes are really communities of interests, people who are online expressing themselves and sharing about things that are uh, relevant to them, irrespectively of you know, age groups and uh, demographics and so on, but really uh, sharing uh, things in common. So in this case, this was helping the, um, uh, the marketing and the consumer insights teams at Denon to be more relevant and authentic in, in their communications uh, around specialized nutrition uh, products. So we, we created a tribe around parents of young children um, in Brazil, helping them really understand, you know, what um, those people were sharing, what their concerns were, um, and, and really drive better uh, content uh, generation by identifying their interests, their activities, their values, and their perspectives, and so on. So this is a, a use case which will uh, require some higher level of uh, maturity and really understand also you know, for instance, in this case, are you ready to tailor your content creation to a specific tribe? Um, so it requires some higher level of maturity, but this is what uh, can be done with social data when you're entering that stage. 
Um, and the disrupting uh, stage is a very interesting one. This is this is a slide from a, a webinar we did with um, with Spanner Car, uh, talking about how um, you know they've been they've been pursuing a complete integration of social data in their digital transformation uh, journey. And this is them expressing in their own words. And this webinar, by the way, is on replay available on the Meltwater website. So, um, you know, for those of you who are interested, uh, I definitely encourage you to, to watch it. But this is really uh, around addressing those big uh, objectives um, for the entire uh, brand organizations. So first, moving from one time to real time, which is moving from that, you know, static uh, market research approach uh, which was their historical approach to having a real-time pulse on the, the voice of the consumer. Second, not just being reactive and, you know, of course, you know, reacting to crisis or new developments in the markets, but also being predictive and being able to, you know, forecast volumes or, you know, um, innovate some new products and so on. Um, the important thing, and I think, you know, this is the process uh, piece that um, Jessica was talking about, is making sure that this social data is not you know, in one place, but it's disseminated uh, across the um, the organization and part of the the business processes. Um, and second, that you know the 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 consumer insights group, which at Pernod Ricard is um, you know driving this uh, this transformation journey around social data, can form true partnerships with uh, the rest of the business functions. And so, examples of the things they've been able to do is really. Uh, looking at translating millions of conversations into actionable qualitative insights uh, around, for instance, cocktails. This, is a, this has been a great success uh, of using uh, our platform and structuring the data around different types of cocktails, different types of ingredients, uh, including in those cocktails, different moments of consumptions, and being really able to understand, um, you know, who was drinking uh, what and when. Uh, and really transforming the way um, you know brand managers thought about their communication, uh, thought about their products, uh, and so that's that's just one example of the things that uh, Panerai Car has been um, able to achieve. And this is um, really, um, I think, you know, how they think of themselves uh, as using social data at this disrupting stage. So we wanted to share that we with you guys, but again, uh, the fun part is um, you know using it yourself. So. You can uh, scan this QR code and uh, find out about your score uh, in minutes. And again, this is not a this is not a contest, as uh, Jessica explained. This is about trying to assess where you stand with uh, using you know social data and where you stand with uh, social media intelligence. And for us, the most important is trying to help you prioritize what to do next. Um, is it about developing new use cases, going beyond the one beyond the ones you've implemented? Is it about driving adoption with more teams, more markets, um, or is it about making this data more actionable and really taking uh, business decisions uh, and executing on, on this social data? So feel free to scan this and, um, and you know, you can do it um, whenever you want. This link is a, is a, you know, permalink, so you can, um, and you can find it back on our website as well. Um, and so going through those uh, questions will take you just minutes and you will get your assessment uh, by email and, um, and of course, we're, we're very happy to discuss with you on the, the results of this. All right, so now let's move on to the questions. So again, um, you can use the, the go to webinar control panel to ask any questions you like, and um, we'll try to answer them with, uh, with Jessica. Great, I see a few questions already. Um, first one, will there be a recording shared with attendees later? I yes, so we will yes. share that. Um, yes, you will share the recording, and of course, uh, you can also um, anyone can find it on demand on our website uh, later on. So we will do that. Okay, great. Um, so yes to that question. Uh, let me get to the next question. I think the next one is: Can you provide some examples of prob probabilistic social data? Uh, especially for B2B. So you mentioned, um, Jessica, and I think it's mm -hmm. a great example of moving from deterministic to probabilistic, probabilistic social data and the fact that some people were not comfortable with it. So maybe can you share mm -hmm. a few examples on this? Yeah, probabilistic data, uh, B2B, okay. Sorry, I, I sit on the B2C marketing team for full disclosure, but I can I can come up with some B2B <laughs> examples. 
Um, okay, so probabilistic data, things like um, uh, people who tend to live in the Northeast are, uh, and it's and it's December, are likely living in colder climates. Those are um, behavioral types of data that you have uh, historical data that you can make educated guesses because there is a high correlation between living in the Northeast, it being colder in December and maybe subsequently needing jackets um, versus shorts. Uh, in a B2B context, that's maybe a little bit more difficult for me, but you could think about um, uh, if you're a software provider like Linkfluence, you may see uh, and you are serving certain brand customers in certain geographic regions, you could make high correlation uh, assumptions that those living in the Northeast uh, are experiencing certain types of uh, environmental behaviors that might lead them to search for things like parkas over shorts, or it might lead them to um, be more interested in warm beverages than cold beverages, for example. Um, you can try to make uh, assumptions or high correlations about the behaviors that you're seeing based on geography or something uh, similar. You may also um, think about another example that just came to mind is highly correlated topics, right? So um, people searching for, uh, or not people searching for, but you, you may see high correlation between um, uh i don't know co computers and accessories uh, because you're selling to uh, merchandisers who are selling consumer technology for example um, and you may you may see some probabilistic data saying there's a high correlation between marketing mobile devices with laptop devices um, so those are the kinds of, I guess, I don't know if I'm doing a good job on the B2B examples, I'm really sorry, but in terms of probabilistic social data, uh, it's more about making uh, generalizations rather than knowing that Guillaume lives in New York City. I don't know if that's true. Uh, lives in New York I, Jesse, live in New York City, <laughs> and um, uh, I want this kind of, uh, of mobile device. Um, so that's, I guess, the way to think about the probabilistic social data is you're making more educated guesses and generalizations than you would be with deterministic data. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, and sorry, and, I and to add to that. <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, it's, it's those are good examples. And I think to add to that, I think you know when when you look at what social listening platforms bring, they bring also a lot of of things like you know sentiment analysis, content classification. Um, I think there's a question of like you know privacy limitations about understanding demographics, age groups, and so on. So we use a lot of inference uh, algorithms to kind of guess, uh, make an educated guess, as, as uh, Jesse mentioned. And I think one of the things we're seeing a, a lot is going back to the maturity model. When when you deal with probabilistic uh, data, it means there's a chance it's wrong. And and the analogy I will take here is that it's not because you're vaccinated that you won't get COVID. I think we've all experience uh, some version of that. And I think it takes a step, it takes a while for an organization to be comfortable with this. So when you start using social data, you will hear a lot of things which are true at 90, 95%, uh, but not necessarily true at 100%. And so there's a, there's some maturity to, to gain, to be comfortable with this. Great. Uh... And hopefully that helps answer that question. Uh, the next question is, where does social media response management fit in the entire mix, responding to complaints, queries, or feedback? Yeah, I, I, can, I see social response as um, another data input for listening, for voice of the customer, for broader consumer intelligence. There is a lot of valuable feedback in social response data. Um, consumers and sometimes known customers are telling you that your product is broken and needs fixing, or the product could be tweaked, or the service could be tweaked in this way to improve it. That is really valuable feedback that um, they are giving you directly, um, unsolicited often. Um, so when you think about the broader consumer intelligence program that you're running, I, in a more mature state on the maturity curve, you are running text analytics on social data, the, including the customer response um, or the customer service data you're doing on social media, all the activity in your DMs, for example, 
um, alongside customer call center transcripts, alongside web chat transcripts. Um, uh, and, and you're hopefully able to look at that in entirety because it is all part of that broader consumer intelligence, part of that broader voice of the customer uh, feedback that you that companies um, can really utilize to to make business decisions. Okay, Guillaume, did you have anything to add? Oh. No. Um, let's move on to the the next one. Maybe there's um, a yes, question on you know with privacy deck. limitations. Oh, sorry, I wanted uh, to yeah. question. <laughs> um, maybe uh, yes. Yeah, so we will we will share that as well. Uh, but there was a question on with privacy limitations, how reliable are geographic, demographic insights from listening? Yeah, uh, reliable is an interesting word that <laughs> you're using there in the in the question. Um, it is a very valid question, um, particularly with the increase in user privacy regulation um, and attention to the topic. Um, each social media network, as Guillaume will tell you, I'm sure in more detail, each social media network has different terms of conditions and rules about um, what data they can create and make available through the APIs to uh, brands like yourself. Um, each, each social media platform almost needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case, case basis in that way. But in general, for example, Twitter will use uh, data from your bio. You may have indicated in your own user bio that you live in New York. Uh, and so Twitter can lean on that for geography. Um, when you created uh, your Twitter account, you may have offered your birthday. You may have offered certain data points in creating that user account. And if your account is public, Twitter may be able to leverage all of that to make, again, aggregated and anonymized uh, takeaways about people in New York at this age might be interested in coffee. Um, other social media platforms are less open, um, Facebook in particular, LinkedIn is another one where they may not share as much data, even though when you've created a profile, you, um, uh, you have offered some of that information. Um, the other way that uh, social media platforms and social listening platforms um, assess geography and, and demographics is what you write in your actual post as well. And if that post is public and you've said, hey, I'm in New York today, that might be an indicator of, of things. Or I'm a woman and I think this, um, another indicator. So when you say reliable, again, it's uh, an interesting word you've chosen there, but it's more about, um, in my opinion, aggregating the data that is available through the bio and through the uh, post itself, and then uh, making generalizations with enough statistically significant data to then draw conclusions at an anonymized and aggregated level. Hopefully that helps. Guillaume, I don't know if you wanna add anything. Yeah. And, and just to add uh, maybe a, a couple data points to this, I think you know on our end when we develop some some capabilities on 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 Linkfluence on the Linkfluence platform, we we look at getting ninety percent, um, you know, uh, relevance here, which means that we'll, our algorithms will be right nine times out of ten at least. That's what we're trying to push for in terms of inferring things like you know ages or locations and so on. So it means that you know again back to the previous question, you know we're going to be wrong. Um, one times out of 10. And this is where you need to be um, comfortable enough with that probabilistic type of, of data to derive the right conclusions from it. And there are many cases where this is good enough and, and some cases where you have to be a little cautious and it depends on the on the, the volume of data and the statistical significance you're looking at getting. I think we're, um, we're maybe going out of time. Maybe there's one last question I think that I think was interesting um, to, to look maybe um, that we can end with uh, uh, just to get if you're okay. I think you know there was a question on how do you get um, how do you you know th there's also a headcount issue which is like you know you need to have um, more headcount to have more RI. So um, you know somebody was describing we're now at a stage uh, of buy-in to get more headcount. How should I position my business case to hire more people? Uh, I know we can achieve greater ROI, but I have to sell that to my leadership. So any advice, uh, Jessica, on um, getting the, the business case presented internally? Yeah, business case is always a, a tough, it's a conundrum for many. Okay, well, first, let me say, if you can't solve the business case, um, 
immediately, there is always the option to outsource and hire external, whether through an agency or professional services from a technical, uh, sorry, from your tech solution, your, your third party vendors. So there are alternative options. But in terms of actually making the business case internally, um, there are different ways to sort of show results against social intelligence practices or broader consumer intelligence practices. They often involve showing four different areas, brand value, brand equity, brand satisfaction, and um, I'm blanking on the fourth one, brand value, brand equity, brand satisfaction, and brand, it'll come to me, I promise. But let me start with the brand satisfaction one. This one is, um, this one is pretty straightforward in terms of brand satisfaction. A lot of this has to do with measuring uh, CSAT, net promoter score, how satisfied are consumers with your brand? Um, and what a common, I think, metric we find across clients who are measuring this. Um, the second one about brand equity, this is where a lot of your uh, intelligence practices, particularly your social media data, can tell you what kind, what sort of equity do you have in the marketplace? What are the most commonly used uh, descriptors and feelings about your brand? Is it for Coca-Cola, refreshing? Is it um, for Uber, you know, quick service? Um, what are sort of those equity words that are common, commonly associated with your brand? And how do they track over time? Social intelligence can sort of reveal um, the brand equity. Um, sorry, brand intent, that was the last one. So brand intent is how are you tracking along the customer journey and the customer life cycle? How are you able to demonstrate that you are moving the needle with finding people who say, I am interested in, or I was looking at this, or I'm about to buy this, or I bought this and now I'm experiencing X, Y, Z with it. So that brand intent, that brand purpose is um, also a, a tracker that you can keep in mind and benchmark against yourself over time to show improvement um, and why you need more, more headcount to support that. And then the last one about um, brand value is a little bit harder. A lot of people try to equate this to like stock price and tracking stock price. It's a bit of a tenuous connection, but brand value is, is generally how we think about the value of the brand from a financial perspective. And I think there are um, correlations, but not causations with the work you're doing in social intelligence. Certainly what you're doing in social media is not going to specifically and long-term directly impact your stock price. There are a lot of things that go into that equation, but it is interesting to see brands try to track them um, uh, together to see if there are trends that um, spike. So for example, you've launched a new product, you make a big splash on social media, there's a big campaign launch, and then does it track with stock price um, and does it impact that? I have seen brands attempt to do that. As I said, not the most, um, clean practice in terms of causation, more looking at it for correlation. But if you try, if you think about tracking against those, those four different areas, brand satisfaction, brand equity, brand intent, and brand uh, value, you can sort of start building a business case. And I have research on this as well. If you wanna connect with me after, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, that might help you build a business case internally. Sorry, I know we're out of time. No, but that's uh, that's a great answer, and I think you know maybe to to add to that, um, I think on our end we try to also we build a lot of business cases with our you know our clients, and I think we try to correlate that also to the use cases approach that was describing as part of this uh, assessment. And for instance, say you know if we're going to be trying to tackle campaigns, um, you know what is a you know what can social data tell that you know maybe other means of measuring campaign uh, performance. Um, cannot can it do that at a more efficient uh, level uh, for brand perception? You know, we we've seen a lot of uh, companies invest heavily in brand equity models. Um, so again, social data brings um, you know sometimes you know some real uh, time information at a fraction of the cost of a of a brand equity tracker, even though it doesn't do the the, the full brand equity tracker as well. So I think aligning this with use cases is also a way to to make it uh, concrete alongside the things that uh, Jessica was mentioning. Uh, all right, so we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica, again. I think this was a great presentation. Um, there are lots of questions, and um, we'd love for you guys to connect with us down the road so we can uh, continue conversation if you have uh, more questions. Um, feel free to use also the maturity level uh, um, assessment that we've shared. 
Um, this will get you an email and we can start a conversation. We can continue the conversation there. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Jessica, again. Thanks for having me. Bye. <laughs>